Nora's home, uh, Houston Sports Authority, and um, let's see what I forget, and the Order of St. Lazarus. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss transplantation, the past, present, and future. Uh, before we continue, though, let's do a little housekeeping. Please uh, mute your your sound. And if there will be a Q&A at the end of the program, so we ask that you just type your questions in and hold them until, um, until we finish the, the presentation. Um, my name's Kayla Lehman, and uh, through the gift of life, I received a kidney 11 years ago, so I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, I'm also a Norris Home board member, past executive director. I'm a volunteer with the Order of St. Lazarus, Life Gift, Donate Life, and also a board member for the 5K Anyway um, World Games. So through the, my, you know, the friendship that I've developed through this, I've reached out to four amazing speakers tonight and ask if they could share their wisdom, their inspiration to discuss this. Uh, tonight, we have Dr. Osama Gaber. We have Dr. Kim Ken Martsugu. We have Kevin Meyer and we have Janice Burke. So without any more ado, uh, I do wanna add this program will be um, recorded and it will be shared through the Order of St. Lazarus on an international level through um, their priorities and also through Life Gift through other uh, uh, OPOs. So thank you for joining us. It's not only tonight that this message will be uh, shared, um, but it will, it will continue to share throughout the future months. And what better time, today's the second to last day of Donate Lives. So thank you for joining us. So I'd like to start with um, Dr. Osama Gaber. And um, he's a special man in my life, my family's life because he, he was my surgeon. Um, Dr. Gaber is the chair of the Department of Surgery at Houston Methodist Hospital, the founding director of the JC Walter Jr. Transplant Center, and he and his wife, Lillian, Dr. Dr. Lillian Gaber, they founded Nora's Home, a home away from, for transplant patients in the Texas Medical Center. And he's also present elect, um, I, think, uh, I think he's present in a matter of few days of the ACT, the American Society of Transplantation. So please welcome Dr. Osama Gaber. Well, thank you so much, Kayla. Um, I wanna say that uh, the list of uh, organizations to which you uh, volunteer and help is amazing. And we are very lucky in Nora's home that you were part of our home. You still are, but that you ran it for so many years. So uh, thank you so much. Um, what I wanna do is very briefly talk about transplantation. <clears throat> and I do have a slightly biased view of transplantation because I followed Dr. DeBakey into transplantation and he was one of the major pioneers in the field. And here he is, you know, announcing the first multi-organ donor that was ever done. He did at Houston Methodist Hospital. They got two lungs, a heart and two kidneys. And that was the first time that was done. The funny part is, and the human part of the story is, on the left, you see the patient who got that first uh, kidney from that multi-organ donor. Uh, he actually was a dialysis patient and his wife that you see beside him in the, uh, in the picture was his dialysis nurse. And uh, to the right hand side is their picture about a year later when they both had their first child proving that transplant patients uh, could actually live normal lives just like uh, we all know now. But at that time it was a novel concept for transplantation. I came to uh, Houston a about 2006 and established was the founding director of the J.C. Walter Jr. Transplant Center. And it was one of the first attempts that the hospital had to organize the transplantation effort. And you can see that transplantation demand has been increasing so much. So this is just our one hospital there. Are, I just was on another call a few minutes ago. There are almost 230 transplant centers across the country. And they all have similar stories, expansion of the transplant effort and people doing a whole lot of transplants, 614 transplants. We started in 2006, less than 200 transplants. So there has been a, a tremendous increase in the transplantation, a tremendous number of lives saved uh, as you're gonna hear. And it's all because of innovation, because of our ability to do things that we didn't do before like swapping kidneys, 
like putting hearts on pumps so that people can get hearts that you know would otherwise not have worked like transplanting getting donors that are their 80s to donate kidneys because we couldn't do that before and it's that amazing innovation that makes our field vibrant that makes us keep on going and and trying to help people and of course it's because of the research and I want to show you, I just recruited this researcher, Dr. John Nichols. <clears throat> and what she does is she takes lungs that are old, gets all the cells out of them, builds them up again on culture, <clears throat> and creates lungs that you can transplant. This actually into a pig. We haven't done it into humans yet, but that's the idea. You can put the lung into the pig, and you can see from the CT scan on the left-hand side, that the lung is perfused, it's, it, 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 it does actually exchange oxygen and you can then get it out later and look at it and study it. So we're making great strides and that's the hope of transplantation. But transplantation is really about the people. And that's the big picture in transplantation. And in New Zealand, they did an amazing project. They took pictures of every person who got transplanted in New Zealand. They keep a really great registry. And that picture, they put it in one line and it, it lasted almost five miles long picture of all the people they transplanted. And then this is just a picture of some of the people that came to take a picture in front of their picture. But that just gives you an idea of the power of transplantation. These are all look to us like normal people. They just all had transplants and all live normal lives. The problem is the need for transplantation is ever growing. This is the number of people with kidney failure. And you can see these curves keep going up. There's almost no abatement in these curves. And it's the same thing for liver disease, fatty liver disease because of weight gain and bad nutrition and whatever we have in our food. You can see that the number of children with admissions with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver disease just up to 2010. And these curves keep going up every single year after that. Same thing with heart failure. You can see heart failure just keeps going up every single year and the need for heart transplantation will increase. The big picture is, if you look at this curve, and I'm sorry, I don't wanna give you a scientific presentation, but the number of people on the list at some point was 121,000. It's probably more than that right now because I made this slide about a year ago. But the number of transplants we do is around 30,000. That gap between the gray line up top and the red line below is what the big picture is. We need more donors. So there is no way for us to get through to saving all of these lives without getting more donors. My story with transplantation is also, besides being professional, is very personal. Many years ago, I actually tried very hard to stop counting so I can stop remembering. I lost my uh, young daughter, Nora. She was seven and a half years of age, a beautiful child. And she became an organ donor. And I experienced organ donation as a doctor and as a father. And it was an amazing experience that made me believe more in the field in which we do. Lots of my friends, supporters, and patients rallied around us, Lillian and I. And we actually decided that we wanted to keep Nora with us. She wasn't the people that got her organs, but we also wanted to keep her as part of our everyday life. And that's what we did. Our friends started a fundraising campaign and we created a Nora's home. That Nora's home started in Memphis, Tennessee, and then we moved it into Houston where we have this beautiful facility where we've raised millions of dollars from all sorts of people from all walks of life that believed in the power of transplantation. This is a home for transplant patients to stay when they're away from their home. It's an amazing place. It's magical. It has Nora every place in it. It's her spirit of making sure that everybody gets taken care of. When she was a child, she would never go to sleep until I assured her that everybody had a place to sleep. And I think Nora's home does that. It creates a place to sleep for people who come from all over the world to have a transplant at the Texas Medical Center. And it's a beautifully crafted facility. And I, I mean, I would kill to have that kitchen in my home. It's just so beautiful. And it serves hundreds and thousands of patients, 40,000 night stays. It serves 
1,300 guests. And it went through the whole pandemic without having one guest develop an infection, without having one staff develop an infection. So it's an amazing place and an amazing help for our patients. We couldn't do what we do in Nora's home without having amazing people. And one of them you're gonna hear in a little while, Dr. Ken Moritzko, who was our, um, one of our great supporters through the orders of St. Lazarus. And this is him and Kayla in the home. And we very much appreciate the generosity of the order in supporting Nora's home. It's a great cause and they've recognized it. And through uh, Dr. Maritzko and his work as the Surgeon General and his amazing story that he's gonna tell you in a little bit, uh, it brings a lot to Nora's home and it's to its guests. I have a special guest that I wanna take my last few minutes of my talk and share with you, let him share with you his story. I was walking in Nora's home, we had an event and I saw this lady standing at the door and she looked really distraught, she looked really sad. And I stopped and this is what I do. I went, put my hand on her shoulder and said, what's wrong, how can we help? She told me that her young son had developed COVID infection and that he was in the hospital and uh, she was praying for him. And I think she just was on a prayer visual that was probably less than like two or three nights in a row because she was not sleeping. I mean, she, you could tell that she wasn't, hasn't slept for a long time. And so I promised her that I also pray for him, go check on him in the hospital. He turned out to be in my hospital, not in any other ones. So I go check on him. And she showed me that picture that you see on the left. And I wanna let, uh, uh, um, Natalie, introduce our guest for a second because she knows more of the story. Natalie? Of course, I'd be honored to. So um, Andrew Kappen um, and his mom, Brenda, um, came to us via um, Colorado um, and Andrew was spending time in Corpus Christi for work when he um, developed a COVID infection, which turned into a re really dangerous situation. Um, Andrew is on the call today, and I would like to turn it over to him to share a little bit more about his experience, and, um, and we're just so glad to have him and his mom with us at Norris Home and recovering really well. I'm looking for Andrew, if you have. He's there, he's just on mute. He needs to yeah. yeah, there we go. There we go. I got it. Thank you. I kept it in the button. Um, yeah, sometime uh, last year, uh, last July, um, I was in uh, Corpus Christi for work and somewhere there I contracted the COVID-19 virus and it landed me in the hospital for eight straight months. Um, lost a lot of weight, lost my lungs, about 80% of my butt. And, you know, that was probably the worst loss, no pun intended, but it was one of my better assets. Um, and uh, my mom and my dad uprooted their lives to come live near me so I wouldn't be alone. Um, and then uh, Nora's home was a nice place to land once I finally did get out of the hospital. It's a beautiful facility and it actually does feel like a home. It's not our home, but it is, is as close as we have right now. Um, you had a double lung transplant, right? Andrew? Yes, sir. Yeah. How long, how long ago did you have that? Because you look so good. I don't think anybody's going to believe how, how, how little time has passed. Uh, yeah, it was uh, in January, right. January 30th. Um, I had my double lung transplant. And yeah, uh, other than the weight loss, I, I feel great. I'm, I'm still like getting back to walking good, but still, it's, it is a blessing. Well, we're so happy that you uh, made it through this ordeal of losing your lungs to COVID infection. And, and we're so happy that Nora's home was a place that you and your mom could stay in. And uh, it's really exemplifies what organ donation does. It took somebody like Andrew, who couldn't be weaned off of the breathing tube 
And now he hopefully will go back to 100% of his life. So thank you, Andrew, for sharing. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be playing Ultimate Frisbee very soon, I, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaber. Do you have anything else to add? No, you're good. Uh, he's always, I mean, it's so informative and but also the, his inspiring story um, makes you, all of us raise that flag, donate life. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, introduce Rear Admiral Kenneth Mortsugu. And uh, Dr. Mortsugu is, was the Acting Surgeon General of the United States. He's recently retired from the board of directors of the Washington Regional Transplant Community, where he had served as a public representative for over 25 years. And in 2007, the International Organ Donation Congress named him the first international ambassador for organ and tissue donation. Um, I, I have to put this in right now. These, the bios of all our speakers are so lengthy, including Dr. Mart Sugos and Dr. Everyone's. They will be in our notes at the end. So um, that's briefly describing his accolades. So thank you for joining us out of your busy schedule, Dr. Martsuko. Thank you very much, Kayla. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before I um, rang on, I was looking at uh, our screens. We're uh, in three full screens uh, on, on this uh, on this call, that's at least 75 people. Uh, and I think that that's really fabulous because your presence is a visible manifestation of your commitment and passion to helping and healing. Uh, as Kayla uh, introduced me, I'm Dr. Kenneth Moritzugu, the Grand Prior of the Military and Hospitaller Order of St. Lazarus of Jerusalem here in the United States. I'm a physician and a former Surgeon General of the United States. The Order of St. Lazarus is a Christian ecumenical chivalric organization dating back all the way to at least the 13th century, dedicated to the chivalric ideals of faith, honor, and charity by promoting Christian unity and the relief of human suffering. Simply put, we are trying to be good people doing good things. Here in the United States, in carrying out our mission, we've focused on two areas of special focus, leprosy and organ donation and transplantation. Many of you can make the connection between our order and leprosy with our name, including the leper in the Bible, Lazarus. But there's another Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, who are special friends of Jesus. One day, when Jesus was away, Lazarus died and was buried. When Jesus returned to the mourning sisters, he stated that Lazarus was not dead, but sleeping. He proceeded to call Lazarus, who rose from his tomb alive. And if you stop and think about it, what, a be what better metaphor is there than to compare this, this story of Lazarus, who died and arose from the dead, to the modern miracle of organ donation and transplantation, through which individuals destined to die from their medical conditions arise again from the dead to a renewed life with an organ transplant. Today, I'd like to us to consider briefly a medical problem affecting about 120,000 individuals right now. Consider a medical problem from which 20 people die every day. That's nearly one every hour. And a new name is added to the waiting list about every 10 minutes. Consider a medical problem for which there is a solution because the reason fellow human beings are dying is because not enough people are willing to do something about it. Consider a medical problem that doesn't have to be. Well, it's obvious. That problem is the need for organ and tissue transplantation and organ and tissue donation. But what does 120,000 people really mean? Can we put our arms around that? 
Can any of us really picture these individuals? Well, the average NFL stadium holds a little bit less than about 70,000 spectators. So imagine every seat in that stadium filled with individuals waiting for a life-saving transplant, nearly twice over. Although last year about 40,000 individuals were fortunate enough to receive an organ transplant, this represents only about one in three who are waiting. You know, as Dr. Gaber uh, uh, alluded to, organ transplantation is really relatively young. The history of modern day transplantation dates back a little more than a half a century to about 1954, when Dr. Joe Murray performed the first successful kidney transplant between identical twin brothers. In 1967, Dr. Christian Barnard completed the first heart transplant. And in that same year, Dr. Tom Starzl had the first successful liver transplant. But over the years, despite attempts to create artificial organs, to clone organs, or to utilize organs from other species, what is still that great limiting factor is the availability of organs to transplant. As Dr. Gaber and I'm anticipating Kevin Meyer is gonna be discussing transplantation, I wanna focus on the other side of this transplant equation, the final common pathway without which transplantation cannot occur. And that is organ donation and the people who make it happen. Organ donation and transplantation are messages of hope because transplantation is the end of the line option available to people who have exhausted other ways to save their lives. In our great nation, we've brought organ transplantation out of the experimental into the community standard with people living fruitful, productive lives for years, if not decades. And the one thing we lack is a sufficient number of organs to transplant. And that's dependent on a sufficient number of people, individuals generous enough to consider becoming organ and tissue donors without whom nothing can happen. Individuals who have organ failure lose their quality of life. They lose their very lives. Their families lose a loved one. Their colleagues lose a valued friend and society loses. We can and we must do something more than what we are doing. Organ and tissue donation is really a very personal matter that touches people as Dr. Gaber showed on his presentation. It's a far cry from merely the science and the technology of modern medicine. I know, just as Dr. Gaber knows, from firsthand experience. 35 years ago, my late wife, Donna Lee, died in a severe auto crash. We had talked long before about wanting to be organ donors when we die, and I had the privilege of carrying out her wishes. And 35 years ago, because of that decision she had made, a marine biologist in Tampa, Florida received a healthy heart, a 35-year-old diabetic hospital custodian in Washington, D.C. received a pancreas and a kidney, a 12-year-old child who was on dialysis and failing in school received her other kidney, a retired school teacher in Pennsylvania received a fresh liver and was able to spend Christmas again with her family. Although she did not survive long, she was able to enjoy a bit more of life for herself and for others around her. A young woman in Baltimore, Maryland received one cornea and the other cornea provided new vision to a 49 year old government worker. Because of that decision Donna Lee had made, several people received a fresh organ and a new lease on life. But that's not the end of the story. About four years later, my younger daughter, Vicky Leanne, who was 22 years old at that time, was struck by an auto and died. 
she too was an organ and tissue donor. And because of Vicki, a mother of five children from upstate New York received a heart and a new lease on life for herself and for her family. A widow with four children received her lung. A 59-year-old man from Washington, D.C., active with a local charity, received her liver. A widower with one daughter received one kidney and a married working father of several children received the other. A 26-year-old man in Florida received one cornea and a 60-year-old woman in Pennsylvania received the other. Because of Donnelly and because of Vicki Leanne and because of so many other organ and tissue donors, many others have gained from a renewed life and an improved quality of life. My late wife and my late daughter, like so many other daughters, living donors, living and deceased, have achieved extraordinary things. It, like a pebble that's tossed into a pond, the ripples of life expand outwards, affecting not just the donors and the recipients, but the families, the friends, the colleagues, the co-workers and others. And in turn, these people affect so many others in ever expanding circles of life. Donation and transplantation affect society, not just one person. And that's why we must make it happen. Our program here today is part of our efforts to reduce the number of those waiting for a life-giving, life-enhancing transplant by raising the level of awareness of how much one person can achieve through organ and tissue donation. As the grand prior of the Order of St. Lazarus, as a physician, as a former Surgeon General, as a donor family member twice over, I implore us all to become more knowledgeable about organ donation and transplantation, to become advocates to others, to your family, and on your own behalf about this critical life or death issue. Through the kindness of strangers, organ and tissue donation is a message of hope and it's a promise of life. Through the efforts of people, of individuals, of ordinary people, achieving extraordinary things. Donation becomes possible. Transplantation becomes the reality. This is where we are today. And we look forward to an improved tomorrow through increasing the legacy of life through organ donation and through organ transplantation. Each of us has the power to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moritzugu. Wow. And, and you know, you and Dr. Gaber both, um, I think I'm speaking for everybody here and that will hear this, is we admire your unselfishness to donate and your compassion for others. You serve as an example for so many. Thank you. Wow. Um, our next speaker uh, I'd like to introduce, he's a friend of mine, and uh, when I had my transplant, uh, I think we only had two million in this OPO registered, and he will share how he has just turned this amazing organization, um, just set an example for all the OPOs in the United States. Um, Kevin Meyer, he serves as the president and CEO of the Life Gift, the Organ and Tissue Donation Agency based in Houston, Texas serving 109 counties and over 200 hospitals and 10 transplant centers. He's a busy man. Meyer serves on the boards of the American Association of Tissue Banks, Donate Life Texas, Donate Life America, and the Organ Donation and Transplantation Alliance. Help me welcome Kevin Meyer. Great, Thank, thanks Kayla. Um, gosh, it's such a tough act to follow, following Dr. Gaber and Dr. Moritsugu who have been incredible mentors and, and leaders in the field. And I've learned so much from, from you guys. And it's so nice to, to hear the words hope and people, because that's what this is all about. And so many friends out there I see in the audience that you know we've had the good fortune to meet and know many of our ambassadors of hope. 
And so Manny, if you could get our slides, um, my slides uh, up, that would be awesome. <clears throat> so I get the, the good fortune of talking a little bit about uh, the future, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, and as serving as president and chief executive officer for Life Gift, we spent a lot of time, as have many organ procurement organizations across the country, really focusing on how can we take the progress that we have made and make that progress accelerate and make it more impactful for more people who are counting on us. Um, it's really interesting, again, with the words hope. So our organization, it, we have a simple core mission, which is just three words, we offer hope. It's all about that. Next, please. So just to give you a little picture uh, locally here in Texas, we're one of three organ procurement organizations in, in Texas, but there's 57 across the uh, United States. Some are smaller, many are smaller than we are, and some are larger, but we're one of the larger organ procurement organizations, and we have the good fortune of spending a lot of our time in the Texas Medical Center and, and learning and expanding and growing with Houston. Next, please. So going back to that, we offer hope. For those of you who aren't really familiar with what organ procurement organizations do uh, and what LifeGift does, you know, all of this is about taking care of people. Um, we support grieving families during and after the donation process. We're, we're advocates for those waiting for transplant. We offer hope to families through the opportunity of organ and tissue donation for families to find legacy, as Dr. Moritzuga talked about with his beautiful wife and beautiful daughter and his incredible generosity um, through donation and also Dr. Gaber through Nora. Um, and then coordinating the organ and tissue recovery process with our donor hospitals that we serve, the hospitals across the country uh, and transplant programs. And we partner with hospitals to continue to develop an optimal donation environment. So lots of education and helping our hospitals, even in the midst of COVID, keep the donation and transplant programs going. And we spend a lot of time educating. And the bottom line with all the technology and all the innovation and so forth that I will mention nothing happens without a yes. And that has been one of the most amazing things for me working in this field, starting out as a coordinator on the front lines. Um, you know, all the technology and all the beautiful, smart people doing this work, it all comes down to a yes. It's the most beautiful human act of kindness that I've ever seen. Next, please. <clears throat> So if you guys um, out there don't know specifically, you know, we talk a lot about organs, of course, that's the main focus, but it's really the gift of life that includes tissues. And I'm gonna show a little bit that also includes cells. So we are emerging in our field from not just organs and not just tissues, but also cells like cells from livers, um, cells from other parts of the body from the pancreas, um, bone marrow, and, Definitely each donor, depending on medical criteria, can help more than 75 people. And that number is expanding, which is fascinating because it allows us to expand the impact of each incredible, unique uh, act of generosity. Next, please. So a few numbers and Dr. Gaber and Dr. Mortsigu covered these numbers, you know, fairly with the same detail. There's a lot of people waiting. You know, the interesting thing is we focus on the number of the waiting list, but the waiting list is just a snapshot of all the people across the country and across the world who are dying from organ failure. So it's a huge number. The transplant waiting list is just a segment of it. So we're trying to attack that first and then hopefully with medical innovation and improvements in logistics and, and new ideas and thinking, we're gonna be able to start attacking end-stage organ failure uh, on a more global basis. Next, please. Around, you know, and around that topic, the call to action really is to register as an organ donor. So in Texas, it's donatelifetexas.org. Um, in each individual state, you can register when you get your driver's license, you can register on the web, you can even register through Siri on your Apple iPhone, which is really neat, um, just as one little innovation where technology has, has helped us. So some of the innovation projects that we have in talking about the, the future, um, 
we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to find ways to take each individual donation situation and expand the impact of that gift through clinical transplantation, but also critical research around, again, having organs function better when they're transplanted, finding new ways to use, t to use tissue to treat uh, all kinds of uh, uh, situations which I'll mention, but also find ways to do better with using bone marrow from organ donors. And we're working very closely with the group called Osseum that is now banking bone marrow from deceased organ donors to have a supply of bone marrow available for organ transplantations, organ transplantation to help accelerate immune or the, the research around immune acceptance or immune tolerance versus immune suppression. We're doing lots of work in deceased donor research to understand the science of how, when there's this glorious act of donation, how can we make sure that when the, those beautifully donated organs are recovered by our surgeons, that once they're transplanted, they can actually do really, really well. And the outcomes move from one year or two years to much longer to five years to 10 years. And we're already there with the five to 10 years and even 20 years. We're working with um, a group called the Biostasis Research Institute. We were the first organ procurement organization to fund this. And that's at University of Minnesota and also the Brigham in Boston to look at super cooling organs. Um, there's a National Science Foundation grant for that. So we're very excited about that. There's a press release coming out on that. Also working on using liver cells for test and chemotherapy agents and help reduce the toxicity of, of patients who are being treated for cancer. And so what you're starting to see is it's organ donation and tissue, tissue donation and transplantation and cell donation and transplantation is not just impacting the critical need for organ transplantation, but it's impacting health. It's impacting medical science. And that's why this work, that's why this presentation and the support from all of you is so critically important to help make this go faster. We also do a lot of work and this is, this is you know, many OPOs are doing this, finding ways to help our staff do better at what we do, to help families um, consent and authorize more frequently than they do. So one thing I always have been interested in from a social cultural perspective, so this takes it away sort of from the clinical science, but you know, when I started out talking with families in 1991 at University of Virginia or Medical College of Virginia and places that's where I come from, um, we always emphasized the option of donation. This is before the registries were really up and running. Um, so, and then as, the, as we all became more comfortable and we learned and, and our societies, both in the United States and across the world became more comfortable with donor registries, it's become opportunity is the word, right? I'm hoping that by the time, you know, I wrap it up, hopefully not for a long time, that we're gonna be able to start talking about obligation. Obligation, a social cultural change where our friends and our neighbors and our families don't look at this as just an opportunity, but they see it as an obligation to help their neighbors and their friends wherever, and, and their fellow citizens, wherever they are. So that's a really interesting um, aspect to think about. Next. So a couple areas of interest, um, because of the fact that organs are such limited and precious resources, you know, we don't have enough to go around. So we have to find ways in, through policy, through the national organ transplant system to balance the ability of helping the, the, the most appropriate candidate in a way that doesn't damage the organ because of extended travel time. So we're always fighting time generally. And believe it or not, most organs are just preserved on simple ice. It's the same way they were preserved in 1968. Um, but broader sharing to prevent accidents of geography, like it's not fair to not have access to an available organ just because you live someplace. You should be, there should be equal access to these organs as long as the clinical outcomes are, are similar. Um, so looking at ways to, to make sure those organs do well, to find ways to, um, to fight rejection and in, increase immune tolerance, and learning how to connect with our diverse communities so that there are increasing, there's increasing comfort and trust in making the decision to donate. So all of us are spending lots of time on that. Moving into tissue, so that's skin and bone and heart valves, 
peripheral nerves, uh, corneas from patients who um, are organ donors, but also patients who don't have the ability to, um, um, to be organ donors, but their hearts have stopped. The amount of the impact on that life gift is one OPO through organ donation and transplant and tissue. We impact 75,000 patients per year. Just our little organization here at the Texas Medical Center. Burn scan, wound healing, heart valve replacement, uh, vessels to help a liver transplant when there's not enough vessel, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's increased in emphasis now for the future on, again, on cells, even living cartilage to help all of us uh, uh, weekend warriors like me who knees, my knees hurt, I still run, but eventually I'm going to need to have, hopefully, find ways to, to make my knees not hurt as much. So anyhow, that's a very interesting um, area as well for people in orthopedics and so forth. Next, please. So the key point, this all depends on a yes, whether it's when we talk with families, but hopefully it's with individuals who have made their wishes known through donor registries. That makes it so much better for families in a terrible situation to know that their loved one has already made their decision to donate. And we support that decision to donate. The vast majority of the time, families will support that. Sometimes they will oppose it and we will always do everything we can to support the wish of the individual, including, unfortunately, sometimes we have to go to the courts, but we always advocate for the donor because we wanna follow their wishes. Next, please. So when you talk about the future, when we talk about the future, 2020 was, is still it, I mean, was such a challenge for all of us. 2021, we're still dealing with this. But our organization, like many organizations on the, the OPO side, as well as our transplant centers, we had the busiest year we've ever had. We, we had worked with 452 organ donors, 968 tissue donors, and almost 1,400 organs transplanted. And it's been a blessing for us to work with Houston Methodist and our transplant programs across Texas, who are very aggressive, who never missed a beat during the, the COVID um, crisis. A little bit of a slowdown with living donation to be safe, but came right back on. And we were so fortunate. And I have to say our staff at LifeGift and the staff at um, all of our transplant programs were absolutely just so brave, you know, and so dedicated to keep this work going to help save lives and fulfill our mission of offering hope. Next, please. Couple big ideas, some big ideas, and I did want to show on the right side of the screen just a few graphs like Dr. Gaber talked about. Donation and transplantation is increasing. It's increasing for living donation and it's increasing for deceased donor um, transplantation um, also. And so living donation is such a beautiful thing. Life Gift totally supports that. It's part of our mission, although we don't act, actually get directly involved in it but it is such an important opportunity to get more patients transplanted. And our organization is a member of the Living Donor Circle of Excellence. We were the first OPO to be part of that with the American Society of Transplantation. We have a policy that allows for any of our staff members to make, to become living donors without any impact on their financial situation, their compensation, their vacation or anything. So we're very proud of that. Big ideas for the future. I hope, I hope, I hope in my lifetime that we see international organ sharing and matching. Because of the diversity of our communities, the best way to get a great match is to have more people be in, in the mix. So why, are we, why cannot we cross the line on the map that's drawn in a pencil? Why can't we, why can't we share more internationally? So that's the thing I hope for. Genetically modified organs from, from animal sources, especially pigs, we're very close. We're very close. Cellular transplantation to augment organ transplantation and tissue transplantation. And then ideas of super cooling organs to have on the shelf, if you will, for emergency access. And that's one of the things we wanna do with this Biostasis Research Institute and the Department of Defense is helping to support that. So Life Gift is providing appropriately authorized organs that are not suitable for transplant for this particular work. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had a wounded warrior who's unfortunately has a blowout injury to his liver and, and there's bleeding control, but there's just not a regular liver. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to 
have access to a super cool liver that you can warm up and transplant in to give them, you know, a few more days, a few more weeks until the regular system kicks in. That's our, that's our dream. Next, please. So I, I think I've uh, used up my time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I just want to say thank you to the, the uh, Lazarus Society and to my colleagues and friends here and teachers. It, it's just been so nice to be able to be part of this. I'm so excited. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you. Well, the future is, is exciting. Um, just let's speed it up, right? Yeah. Uh, before we go to questions, our last but not least, I want to introduce... Uh, Janice Burke, and she is, what a gift to Houston. She came to Houston as the CEO of the Houston Sports Authority, and she has brought in the Super Bowl, it, I, all the sports championships, but most importantly, in, in 2014, she brought in the USA Games, and uh, she and her team are fearless. They're, they work tirelessly um, and just just are, are great to work with. Um, in, I guess it was in 2014, she started working for the international, the world games. And uh, after 40 plus years, Houston was selected. We were all very excited. And then guess what happened? The big P, the pandemic. So she has just put her thinking cap on, she and her team, and she's here to share about the 5K anyway. And uh, Janice, we welcome you and thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Um, let me just, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because I I'm only want to take a couple of minutes. Um, sorry, it's not for some reason. It's not going into my normal zone, but I'll just go through this really quickly. So as Kayla said, I was introduced to the transplant world through the games and um, boy, what an in education it was for us. And that's where sports and games can sometimes collide into education. And at the time when we hosted, we were hovering in Texas. Um, Kevin reminded me earlier around 4 million and we're now over 13 million on our donor registry. And so we use the games as a platform to bring lots of groups together. But due to COVID, we had to cancel. And this was back last summer when we had to make the decision. We knew nothing about virtual events or what kind of platform we would use, but we did not want the opportunity um, to leave Houston to to host the world. So we came up with an idea that we would do a virtual 5K anyway. Um, we didn't wanna limit it. Um, we wanted it to be open to basketball players, swimmers, cyclists, anybody who wanted to participate, they would just log a 5K. The race dates are May 28th through June 4th. And then we're gonna do a celebration because one of the things that we've learned with the transplant community is they are a close-knit group that like to share ideas. And so we didn't want that to be missing from the games. Um, we have people um, that are participating in all of the ways you can see on the right there that they have just been super creative and we're gonna recognize that creativity. Um, but somebody figured out, you know, if I throw 275 bowling balls down uh, bowling alley lane, that equals a 5K. And so they have entered the 5K in that way. We did not want anyone to not participate because of uh, cost. So we kept the cost low to just cover the platform. Um, and, and we made it that anyone and everyone could be eligible. We want doctors, nurses, uh, donor family supporters, and those that are recipients as well as, as um, you know, those that are, are waiting. We have two people that have registered that are waiting for a kidney right now. That has never happened in the games before, but since we're virtual, we can allow it to happen. Um, we will give out awards, the normal awards for the fastest times for those that can be timed, but then we're going to just do some fun things with best dress, best fundraiser, largest country um, team, you know, largest fundraiser, things like that. Um, we wanted to make it America's game since it had been 41 years since it has not been in uh, the United States. And so our logo and everything that we're doing, our local organizing committee that meets monthly is from all over the United States. And we wanted it to make it the largest transplant event, event ever, um, global event uh, to happen. And so we're, our goal is to have 12,000 participants. And we wanted 20% of them to be brand new to the games, again, for that educational piece of what is going on. Um, so far we have 42 countries and it blew us away when we rolled this out and we could watch it on our social media, just rolling from country to country. 
as people were waking up in the morning and we made this announcement. And right now we have over 75% of the people that are signed up are new participants, had never heard of the games before, had never been involved. We have two registrants, like I mentioned, that are on the wait list. We have straight donations, um, people that want to donate a dollar or two dollars. Um, when they close out, we ask, hey, would you like to donate a dollar? And so far we've collected $19,000 um, that will go straight to the Fit for Life program through the International Federation. We have 39 states now. This hasn't been updated over here on the left. So we've got 11 states to go um, when we will have all 50 states involved. So we're working on that. And as you look at the partners and the hospitals from across um, the pond um, that we're working with from LA to Chicago to Houston, and then all of these um, transplant organizations that have stepped up and said, yes, we wanna be a part of this. Again, I think it has shocked us a little bit um, of how, um, how much people have wrapped their arms around this and said, yes, we're gonna support this virtual event. Um, we have um, right now about 5,000 participants. So we're about halfway to our goal. Um, we have a social re media reach right now every time we send out a message to over 1 million people um, because of all of these organizations that have joined forces with us. Um, we have, um, again, about 51,000 people that have saw an ad, saw a social media post and come to the registration site. So again, it has just been amazing for us. The cultural event has been really interesting. We went to NASA because it's such a Houston um, iconic institution. And we said, do you have any interest in helping us with the celebration? And they said, absolutely. Right now they're doing a lot of research in space to see how cells grow um, in Petri dishes in space. We have had several conversations with the astronauts who are up there right now. Um, and we have incorporated them into our celebration. And it's pretty, it's pretty um, fun to watch as they pass the mic and it floats over to the other astronaut. And as they um, talk about participating, they have treadmills that they lock their feet into to, to uh, participate. So we will start in space with the celebration. We will go down to earth. We want every country to feel included. So we will have different languages and we will be recording at Epcot Center, Disney said we're in. And so behind, um, behind our speakers, they will be in the country and everybody will be tuning in live um, from these uh, 42 countries. Um, we, oh, sorry, we have uh, Star Power that we reached out to, Selena Gomez, um, uh, George Lopez, who both of those have had kidney transplants. Uh, we are in conversations with their foundations. We, uh, Jeff Bagwell, we were talking to him at the Houston Sports Awards and found out that his very best friend from childhood had a liver transplant. So he's super passionate about it and he will be involved in our celebration event. And yesterday uh, at our a uh, 30 day kickoff event and media event, I found out that Calvin Murphy, longtime Rockets legend, part of the NBA, um, Hall of Famer, um, his daughter had a, a transplant, two transplants, an eight hour surgery. And so he will also be joining our celebration. And we have talked about lots of different ideas. Uh, could we do a concert with Selena, um, you know, on one of the rooftops showing the medical center with Houston in the background, or do we do it at one of the stadiums that we own? So we're still working through those details um, and we will have more information in the next few weeks. We've added coffee chats. Um, this is something new for the World Games. They've never done that. And Kayla has been helping with that to get speakers and then I'll allow people to chat. Uh, again, people from all of these various countries, we have a platform that they can listen in their own language if they don't speak, speak English. And then this is one of the really neat uh, legacies, build a bear when you go into the mall and your kids make the bear and you put the, the stuffing in. And the last thing that goes into the bear is the heart. We thought what a great um, partnership that could be. So we reached out to them, they loved the idea. So they have provided 3,600 bears. So every time a team uh, reaches 10 people, they unlock a bear and those bears will be given to children all over the world on the transplant wait list. And when you think about it, um, pretty special for parents that are sitting there with their kids, maybe at the Texas Medical Center and Team Italy, who they've never met, just walked a 5K or ran a 5K or participated in any way that they are through their 5K and, and they receive a bear for their child that with a note from Italy saying, Team Italy supports you, there is hope, we're here, we've been through it, 
uh, we, want, we want you to know that you're being thought of. So we think that's really powerful. We've been doing a lot of presentations like this one um, and going out to as many people as possible. We do have some countries, South Africa, um, there's some Central and South America countries that have reached out to us that can't afford the $25. And we don't, again, want that to be um, uh, something that keeps them from participating. So we have corporations that have stepped up and given us um, some dollars. So we have registration grants available for anybody who needs them. All they have to do is call. Um, we also uh, are doing custom uh, content for all of the teams because we want every team to at least reach 10 people because that will unlock a bear. And I will tell you from my own experience, I sent out a message to my family and friends. I created a team, Team Janice Burke. I sent it out and I said, hey, if I get 10 of you to join me um, during the week of May 28th and through June 5th, all you have to do is even walk five miles, we'll unlock a teddy bear for a child within an hour. Uh, my team was full, we had unlocked a bear. And my teddy bear is going to a little boy at Boston Children's Hospital who is waiting for a heart. And you would have thought when I contacted the mother and I met her through a transplant chat uh, social media site, and you would have thought that I was giving her $50,000. She um, couldn't believe that perfect strangers would do this for her. So it is a powerful thing. And um, Last but not least, we're asking everybody who follows us to just hashtag 5K anyway, because we can capture all of the media that is happening right now. We think we're on track to hit about 5 million media impressions on social media. And then last but not least, let me just exit this and I'll show you just what we did yesterday um, real quick. Um, sorry. Um, there it is. You see the pictures? This was our event yesterday. Um, the mayor, um, Mayor Turner, Mayor of Houston came out. The Houston Rockets have joined our efforts. They are a partner. They normally do a Rockets run. Um, and so they are working with us um, to combine their runners with our runners. Um, and yesterday we rocked the 5K anyway. We all painted rocks. Um, Houston's a pretty artsy city. And so we are taking these rocks um, with the Donate Life message with the 5K message, whatever message people wanted to put on there to get to get across that organ donation is important. And we are um, putting them all over uh, Houston. So these rocks will be popping up everywhere. And you can see there was a large uh, turnout there. So um, thank you for letting me tell you about it. We'd love to have everyone's involvement. And um, thank you for um, everybody who has been just a part of this. I will tell you Life Gift, or, or um, I'm sorry, um, Living Bank, has already unlocked 12 bears. They've been amazing. So it's been really fun to watch. Thank you, Janice. What did I tell you? I mean, she is, I think every corporation needs a Janice. She's amazing. Uh, time's running out, but uh, we, we'd like to take some a few questions. Uh, I'll start with one to Dr. Gaber. Uh, chronic conditions lead to more patients on the list, yet these same conditions also prevent people from being donors or may rule them out. Where do we begin solving this problem? So I saw that question and it's really a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. It's correct. I think we start solving this problem by treating organ failure before it happens. Mm -hmm. That's been one of our goals in the transplant center. So we changed our concept from treating being a transplant organization into an organ failure management structure. The idea is that we can decrease the number or the need to transplantation by decreasing the number of people that need a transplant. It didn't occur to me that that would improve the quality of organ donors, but I guess that's a, a good side impact of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need, need to eat right and exercise and take our vaccines and do all these good things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kevin, can you expand what it means to super cool organs and how it impacts a recipient? Yeah, so the, yes, absolutely. So we're, the research is focused on smaller organs right now. And so it's taking organs way, way, way super cool down into even below minus 80. Um, the big challenge with that is you can freeze organs. It's difficult to freeze complex organs like livers and so forth, but you can, it, it works. The hard part is thawing them out. 
because when you freeze things, you get water crystals. And when you thaw them out, the water crystals break the cells. But at uh, University of Massachusetts, um, Dr. Corkett, Oregon, Oregon, it's actually, uh, there's an article published in Nature a while ago that he successfully did it. So um, we're, we're, all, we're past the sort of the main barrier to this. So it's super, super, super cooling into a thing, to a layer or a status called vitrification, where the organ almost becomes glass. It sounds very science fiction-y, but it's a, it's a worthy, noble cause, and it's a great way for people to be able to help impact this by donating organs, hopefully for transplant. If they can't be used for transplant, then we can learn this new approach. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Martsugu, as a leader in government, a doctor and someone with a personal connection, what words of wisdom do you have for our ambassadors of hope, our volunteers? They all share a similar connection as donor family members and recipients. That is a million dollar question, number one. Uh, number two, uh, as Kevin was describing, moving uh, the, the organ donation um, community from option to opportunity to obligation. I think that we, we can definitely do a heck of a lot to increase awareness uh, of the general population. However, when it really comes down to the point of a decision at the bedside in the hospital, one has got to really remember that there are more than one patient. There's a patient that is lying on the gurney, lying in the ER, lying in the ICU, but there are also patients who are standing around that patient and all patients need care. And uh, the one key that I think is important is always treat the family with respect and with dignity. Uh, my pastor has said once, uh, the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as often as we speak. And I think that that's a very good way of treating donor families by listening to them rather than trying to speak with them. Thank you. Well, to honor our time, our our four guests are highly busy people. I'm sure Janice is heading to another event. And, but on behalf of the whole Donation Life community, Order of St. Lazarus, Nora's home guest and family, thank you uh, yes. for taking time out of your busy yeah. schedule. And uh, I do yeah. uh, urge everybody on the call to share your word and become an ambassador yourself for, for Donate Life. That's what we're all about. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Kayla. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all. Bravo, everybody. Thanks for everything. Bye, Natalie. Thank you all very much.